Good morning and welcome to our uh, tomato a Common Tomato Problems webinar. I'm Julie Robinson with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service. And this morning we have got <clears throat> Don Gavin, who is the Bradley County Extension Agent and Staff Chair. And he uh, knows a few things about tomatoes and we're excited that he's going to share those with us. And so, Don, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Thank you Julie. I appreciate that. Uh, we are going to talk about some of the more common types of problems that you can have with uh, tomato production. Um, you know, in generally, there's uh, when you survey home gardeners, they somewhere 80 to 90 percent or so will have tomatoes in their garden. That's, that's across the whole country. So you think about all the different variables that you, you can come across. There are very uh, common problems that that can be occurred. Uh, some of them can be prevented and some of them you just have to deal with as they pop up. But uh, let's talk a little bit about prevention first and just look at what is considered uh, proper tomato culture or growing practices. And first of all is light. Uh, tomatoes like a full sun. They, they, they don't like filtered sunlight. They prefer at least eight hours of full sun and basically they're going to require a minimum of six. Uh, after uh, six hours or less than six hours, you will start seeing some problems show up. Your plants may tend to spindle, uh, look spindly or thin, and maybe even have some fruit setting uh, problems with it. So keep in mind, we do want full sun. Also, the soil. Tomatoes do not like wet feet. They need to be well drained. Uh, you want to keep them moist, but you don't want them setting, setting in water. Uh, a lot of times we don't have a, a choice on where we're going to grow tomatoes. Uh, we, we, we're, we have the soils that we're dealt with, so we've got to do some improvements. And with tomatoes, if your little uh, soils are a little wet, just put them up on a big bed. And that will kind of pick the roots up out of the water and, and get them off to a good start. Fertility, you have to think about tomatoes may put on 20 pounds of fruit per vine, and it takes a lot of nutrients. So we do want a medium rich fertility program to keep them up and going. And if you keep a plant growing healthily, healthy, uh, well then you can uh, avoid some other types of problems might show up. pH is probably one of the more critical things we see uh, in tomatoes. Uh, it can cause so many problems and we'll kind of dive into that a little bit more detail later. I do want to talk about moisture. Now we're talking about a plant that uh, eventually put on about 20 pounds of fruit, uh, it takes a lot of moisture. Uh, tomatoes are probably like 96% water. And when you take uh, producing and growing a plant and trying to size up a tomato in temperatures that's 85, 90 degrees, take a lot of water to do that. Uh, spacing, uh, tomatoes like the elbow room a little bit. Uh, research has shown in uh, commercial and, and home gardeners at 18 to 24 inches between the plants is really considered ideal, although some people can start reaching out 48 to 72 uh, inches. So really, I think that's a little too far, but if you stay somewhere around 20 to two feet, uh, your spacing is going to be, be enough. If you get much smaller than that, you can have uh, competition between plants. And we don't want any competition, whether it's between plants or weeds or something else. A uh, little bit more on location. We did say that tomatoes requires at least six hours up and, it, and prefer eight hours. So when you look at that, you have to look at your site. Uh, is there any problem or what we could cause a problem with getting enough sunlight? And normally it's going to be trees. Keep in mind that trees grows over time. And I've had homeowners call me and say, I used to have the most beautiful garden. And right now I just, you know, everything just don't look right. Everything is spindly or overgrown. And, you know, you start looking around and uh, the trees that's uh, bordering their property have grown to the size that they're starting to really compete because they may only get sunlight between 10 and two. And, but it's happened such a, over a gradual time, the homeowner hadn't realized it. But not only sunlight uh, you can get uh, from, from light, you've got to look at the roots. And uh, you know, tree roots will go out almost as far as the tree is high. So you have that sapping effect on the garden over years, it can increase. 
And of course, we want a slightly slope. I told you earlier, or mentioned that they don't like wet feet. They don't want the water to stand. So if you can have a slight slope, it's ideal. But keep in mind that if it is probably more than 5%, you'd need to really look at uh, controlling some soil erosion that you might can have during excessive rains. Temperatures, uh, it's nothing complicated. It's pretty simple. If you're comfortable, the tomato's gonna be comfortable. Ideally, daytime temperatures of 80s and nights in the 50s and 60s, uh, tomatoes are gonna grow well. Uh, like I said, they're just like us, where we set our thermostat. Later when the days and night starts going above these numbers, that's when we can run into problems. And a lot of times it's fruit setting the fruit is gonna be the main one. We wanna talk a little bit about fertility. Uh, we do know there are medium uh, rich uh, fertility requirements. And really the best way to know what you need to apply to your tomatoes is do a soil test. Uh, it's simple, uh, so you go down to the depth of your uh, plowing uh, depth, maybe about six inches in gardens and pull several little subsamples and then mix them together and take them to your local cooperative extension service and they'll mail it in and within a week or two you should get a result. And that's gonna tell you so much information about your soil, your soil fertilities and, and what you're gonna need to do. In general, if you do not do a soil test and, and just gonna kinda go off the cuff, look at about six pounds per 100 row foot of a complete fertilizer to start with. And I know that doesn't seem like a lot when you're out there in the garden and you're sprinkling it, but uh, that's alone is gonna be equal to about 420 pounds of fertilizer. And uh, that's not all. Uh, if you keep your tomato growing, uh, after you start setting your first cluster, you're gonna come back and do what the old timers called side dressing. And you're gonna put a tablespoon per plant or another pound per 100 row feet. And you say, well, that don't sound like much. But now a tomato plant, especially an indeterminate, which we'll talk about later, can grow over an extended period. So you may end up having to side dress or repeat that every three to four weeks. So you know, you're soon you're going from 420 to 600, maybe seven, 800 pounds per acre if you calculated it out. So remember, you can over fertilize so simple, so simply because it just doesn't look like much when you're doing it. But uh, just follow the instructions and you'll be fine on that. If you do look like having a problem, again, you can contact your county extension agent to come out uh, and help diagnose the problem with that. pH, I mentioned is probably the most critical uh, we do want a soil test. I, if nothing else, we do want to know our soil pH because a lot of our crops uh, will require pH between six and seven. Tomatoes is one of them. In fact, really the closer you can get to six, five, six, eight, the better they like it. Uh, but if you do need to lime, get you some uh, pelletized limestone for your garden and be sure to just uh, garden or put the lime out over the entire area except for maybe where blueberries are. Uh, blueberries like a little lower pH and sometimes Irish potatoes like a, a little lower pH than, than most of our, our vegetable crops. But uh, it is very important. And we're just kind of going to talk about why. If you look up here at seven and go down, all the nutrients that's out there in the soil that we've applied are available to that plant, tomato plant. But as a pH, uh, goes down to six, five, we're still in pretty good shape. But even at six, look at the reduction of the nutrients that will be picked up by that plant. Now, the nutrients are there. It's just that the tomato can't uh, use them. So getting your soil right, getting the pH right, it's gonna let everything come into solution where they can pick it up. Uh, one thing I wanna point out here is the calcium. Uh, calcium is something that we'll talk about probably one of the biggest disorder that everybody suffers from time to time, but it really tapers off under six. Just talk about tomatoes in general. There's just many, many varieties. There's over 300, 400, 500. I heard at one time that there's really almost close to a thousand different varieties out there. So you ought to be able to find one that you really like to grow. Uh, even the size of them. Uh, the, these are some of the old standard cherry tomatoes that was pretty much will produce uh, anywhere you want to grow tomatoes. And then later on, we kind of uh, 
turn our attention to great tomatoes with the Santas. And now Smarties and Tammy G's can easily be uh, purchased, uh, even as plants or as seeds. And uh, they're really quite flavorful. I'm talking about the, uh, when you're, we're out of tomato production time, we still crave a good flavor tomato. And most of the time, the, the, the great tomatoes will give you a good tomato test taste wherever they're from. Another thing that's kind of come around in the last 10, 15 years are the colors of tomatoes. Used to, you go to the store, you had red tomatoes. And that's about all you've seen. But uh, uh, these, some of these varieties has been around for decades, uh, some 100 years. And they've just kind of worked their way in back into the public eye with these uh, dark tomatoes, Cherokee purples, carbons, crims. Uh, zebras, the green zebras, the lemon boys, the yellows, there's tomatoes that's, you know, red when they're ripe and green when they're ripe. So uh, you can just about uh, find a, a color uh, to uh, add to any salad. In fact, uh, a tomato salad is starting to be a real desirable uh, meal, you know, when you go to a restaurant where it's nothing but several different colors, tomatoes, sliced and diced, and uh, with a little... Uh, dressing on it. So there's, there's a, just a wide array. And of course, we always have to revert back to heirloom tomatoes. Uh, everybody, everybody loves the flavor of tomatoes. And, and to be honest, as we've improved tomatoes for higher yield with our hybrids, we have lost uh, some of the old timey good flavor tomatoes. So we turn back to heirloom. So they always say what goes around and comes around. What's old is new again. And it seems that way with tomatoes, but heirlooms are gaining in popularity. Uh, thank goodness the definition is really still loosely defined because uh, once uh, uh, there's a, a bold statement or, or something from uh, the federal government like the organic farming or all natural farming, it does kind of tie everything into a certain thing. But generally we think of an heirloom of tomato being at least 50 years old. Uh, most of them will be open pollinated. That means that you will be able to save the seeds from those tomatoes. And when you plant those seeds, you'll have tomatoes of the truth to the variety. And uh, so you could kind of perpetuate your own seed stock this way, and trade seeds between producers. However, they can be hybrids. Some of our high, old, old hybrids are still being produced. And most of the time what happened is just their sales become so small that the breeders just will quit breeding that particular hybrid. But there's some every once in a while that continues to be, and I'll just point to celebrity at that. That is a hybrid and it's been around 30 years and it is still a, a super good tomato and, and, and still being produced. Most of our heirlooms are going to be associated with superior flavor. It's just, they've just got that down home taste that just kind of make you think, wow, that's a good tomato. And of course, uh, that's what we really want. Uh, we don't want just color. Uh, you know, that's a lot of times we will use a tomato for color in a salad or on a, on a burger. But now we're really demanding flavor from our tomatoes again. And then that's a good thing. This brings us to selecting your varieties. And again, you know, I'm trying to cut off some problems. We're, we, we hadn't really talked about any real problems that you may walk out and see today in your garden, but so much can be taken care of ahead of time. And one of them is going to be variety selection. We done talked about the soil, so now we're going to choose the tomatoes that we're going to produce on it. And there's endless information out there. I mean, you can call a lot of these catalog companies or seed company, and they will send you a catalog. Get online and click yes, send me a catalog, and they'll do it. A lot of information in there. Some of the stuff that you can just quickly see by reading a description is what type of tomato you're going to have, how many days it is to harvest, what size of fruit that you can kind of expect from this particular variety. Uh, is it an heirloom or an open pollinated versus a hybrid? And finally, what I consider is disease resistant. We are so fortunate that plant breeders have put disease resistant in some, so many varieties of tomatoes. And uh, that's what we're going to focus on here. If you look, uh, on this, you got the Empire Hybrid. So we know we don't need to save seeds from that. Tells you that you should be having have fruit around 72 days after you go to the field with your transplant. It is a determinate tomato, and we'll get into growth habits in a minute. 
uh, you should have about 10 to 12 ounce fruit on that. So, you know, if, if you're not getting big fruit and you're getting tiny fruit, four or five ounces, you know, you need to look at some other issues. You may not be feeding properly. You may have to go back and increase your fertility. Uh, more importantly, right here at the bottom, you'll see a bunch of abbreviations. Uh, this here is L for fusarium. There's a code in that catalog somewhere that tells you that this tomato variety is resistant to fusarium one and two, verticillium, nematodes, tobacco mosaic virus. And also a lot of them will give you the use. And here you see the little uh, initial MK, M, uh, MKT, which is suitable for market. So if you're wanting to produce some for the farmer's market, it holds up pretty good. And of course, if it's just strictly ready to eat, it'll say garden. But most of the time with care, they could go both ways. But a lot of information in the seed catalog to help you determine which variety you want to plant. Now the hardcore gardeners will start seeds uh, their cells and grow their own transplant, but the majority of us will just go buy transplants. And uh, keep in mind that uh, usually the early bird gets the worm, and that's the way it works on transplants. Uh, you may need to go ahead of time before you go to the field and, and have a good selection of transplants out there. It is the easiest way. It can be very expensive. Uh, you know, tomatoes used to be in little old six packs for about two bucks, and now you, you're going to these uh, quart and half gallon uh, containers that can be three, four dollars a piece. It doesn't really matter whether it is the smaller ones or in the bigger ones. You still look for some basic common denominators for a good healthy plant. And that is to pick a plant that is completely disease free. Uh, if there's leaves that are spotted, uh, that might be cultural or environmental, but it could be an early sign of, of disease on that plant. So try to buy, buy one that is just totally green without any type of spots or specks on the leaves. If you have to, just pinch them off. Let's not take them out in the garden. Let's just pinch them off before we plant. You do want a straight stem on your tomatoes. Uh, pencil size is ideal. It gives it a rough uh, structure or when you plant that they just don't fall over and lay on the ground. They'll be able to support themselves. Uh, six to eight inches, you can plant the cotyledon leaves and still have most of your plant outside or above the soil. And of course, one of the things we do need to do when we're buying is look at the tag and confirm our variety. There are so many times that these tags can get changed. And I have to admit, I'm probably uh, guilty of doing this. I, I wear trifocals and you have four shells of tomatoes and I'm bending over, reaching and getting a tag and reading it. And then uh, I got to think about, well, I got to bend back over and put that tag in. And sometimes I might take a shortcut and just plop it in on the middle shelf when you go to shop, look at the tags and make sure the tomatoes around the tags are the same variety. Uh, some people can pick up a six pack of tomatoes and just decide, I want something else and set them in there. So you might get great tomatoes uh, where you're getting your big reds. You know, you're thinking you're getting big red tomatoes. So common things can happen. When you go and to plant your uh, tomatoes in the garden, try to do it on a cloudy day or at least in late afternoon. What we're trying to do is minimize excessive wilting. And if you plant them in the heat of the day, even if you pre-water and give them a growth solution, they will wilt, they will fall over. Keep in mind that most of our diseases that affects tomatoes are soil born. They're in the soil. They're, they're, they're not brought in by birds or anything. So when that plant wilts and lays on the ground, or if you're using mulch on that mulch, that's the first contact of that young plant's life with soil borne diseases. And you can inoculate the lower leaves and all you gotta do is just wait for the right environmental factors, water, cold weather to start the disease. So water them, plant them when it's cloudy, water them again, uh, give them plenty of water when they first start. You don't want them wilting and laying down. Sometimes we get uh, to a point where we just get anxious to, to plant. And keep in mind that tomatoes like a soil temperature of 60 degrees. If the soil temperature is below that, you can plant them and they survive. But a lot of times they will just not grow. They're not, you're not going to see any real growth in them. And what's happening is you're exposing that plant to many 
test before they ever really can take off and grow. I mentioned earlier you want to plant the little first two little leaflets on the stem, the cotyledons, under the ground. Um, that way you know that the entire root ball is, is underground and dirt has been pulled up. Many times when people set out tomatoes, they put just a thin layer of soil on that root ball and the water in that root ball evaporate out on these sunny days. And for about two or three days, the only moisture that that plant has is what's in that root ball when you plant it. So this will keep plants from uh, uh, wilting. You know, if you got them deep down, they can serve that moisture in that root ball and use it. If they leggy, don't worry about it. Don't, don't worry about trying to dig a hole deep enough uh, to plant one. Uh, you can simply just lay a, cut a trench and lay it on its side and turn the top up and that's, that's great. In fact, uh, the tomato, when they start growing, um, you have your root ball and all the stem area will grow new and ventaceous roots. And before you know it, it's gonna take off and, and run like a sprinter. So it's nothing to do, but bad about doing this. And again, we're gonna talk about use a fertilized solution just to give it a little kickstart. Irrigation. The majority of us are going to use overhead irrigation. Uh, just keep in mind that when you do this, be sure to uh, finish up your, your uh, irrigation uh, regime that day and give the plant plenty of time so that the leaves can be dry going into the evening. Uh, a lot of wet foliage going in uh, at, uh, at night times will give uh, uh, opportunities for diseases to take hold and grow. So you, you, we really like to keep our leaves dry. Uh, soaker hoses will work great. Keep in mind some of them will have a sprinkler effect. Some of them have a little hose and it sp sprays up before it hits the ground. And again, depending on your soil, a soaker hose will do what it says. It soaks and it does it pretty quick. And uh, your ground or your soil may not absorb the water as fast as a soaker hose can put it out. So <clears throat> one thing I did mention earlier on the culture is moisture. They do like a moist soil, but they want it consistently moist. You don't want to go from, from dry soils to really soggy soils. So sometimes a soaker hose can put it out too much if you don't keep an eye on it. Commercially, our, our growers uh, use drip tape, and but it is so easy to buy uh, kits online now for uh, any type of garden plants. Uh, online, with, it include your drip tape and different fittings so that you can hook it up to your water source. And this stuff, if it's taken care of, can last a year or two. And if you do get a hole in it, there are couplings, special made couplings that you can, you can cut the hole out and, and kind of reconnect the, uh, the, the, the drip tubing. So it can, be, it, it can last several years. And it is available. Uh, let's see where I'm at. Pruning. I want to talk a little bit about pruning, <clears throat> but keep in mind pruning is mainly, mainly used to control growth, either the size or shape of the tomato plant or fruit. Um, some plants requires more prunings than others, like our indeterminates, and we'll talk more about the different plight. But let's keep in mind that what tomatoes will do, if you're going to produce, I'm just going to say uh, 20 pounds of fruit. Would you rather have 20 extra large, large, extra large tomatoes, or would you rather have 30 uh, small uh, tomatoes that might be small to mediums. And that's gonna be determined by pruning. <clears throat> so that's gonna take off a lot of extra growth uh, that's gonna to go to these prunes. Now we call them prunes, suckers, but actually that's a, an entire new plant that forms between the limb and the stem. And this one, if you allow it to grow it, will grow up, add extra clusters and extra fruit. So that's where we get the increased number. And of course, those fruits are going to want to size up and pull resources from the main plant. So if you're really looking for nice, large tomatoes, you will need to do some pruning. Our growth habits, there's two. We have what we call determinate tomatoes. If you remember in that catalog, it told us that that was a determinate. And one thing easy to remember is it's determined not to grow forever. And you can see on this stem, it goes up and the top terminates itself with a cluster. 
So these determinate tomatoes will get somewhere between five and six feet tall and they'll quit growing in height. Now the prunes underneath them will continue to grow and fill up, but our other growth habit is indeterminate. And then keep in mind if determinants are determined to stop, indeterminates will grow forever. If you don't top it, uh, they can be, you know, if you keep them staked, maybe 15, 20 feet tall or long by fall. And uh, this makes them uh, really uh, more adaptable for greenhouse growing because once you go to the expense of growing them in a greenhouse, you want that tomato to keep producing. And of course, there's whole courses you can go on if you're going to grow them in a greenhouse. But a lot of our home gardeners like to produce tomatoes on into the summer. Commercially, we're looking at harvesting four to six weeks and we're through. So we're not looking beyond that because our buyers have left the area. But home gardeners can enjoy tomatoes all year, right up to frost, uh, by pruning and training their tomato plants. We're gonna talk a little bit about staking, sticking, or caging. The whole thing is all about picking the plant up off the ground and uh, allowing uh, air circulation to move around that plant. Most of our diseases will be aggravated by wet foliage. So if we can get them up and let them dry before it gets too hot in the day, we can reduce the disease pressure. Uh, we completely eliminate the contact of soil with our fruit. Uh, there are special rots that will form if your so uh, fruit is laying on the ground. Uh, the plants with your steak will allow more sunlight. Uh, if you think about a plant that's allowed to just lay on the ground, uh, only half the uh, foliage will be up where the sun can hit it. And of course, the sun is the, the energy source of the plant. It's what's going to cause the plant to really grow. So you do want as much sunlight as you can have on it. Uh, if you do have to spray for pests, you can get a better coverage on a plant that is staked. And of course, if you've ever picked butter beans, wouldn't it be nice to know they'll grow up a stake? Uh, reduce a lot of bending over, but it doesn't. It will make uh, uh, harvest them a lot easier. Staking is nothing complicated. You can just use cages. I've seen rebarb, uh, sticks, boards cut in half. It doesn't really matter as long as you can get them up. The old time uh, fashion that we used to grow commercially is just a stake per plant. And we individually tie that plant to that stake as it grows up the, up the stake or the stick, maybe three, four, five times. It is very time consuming. <clears throat> and requires a lot of resources because you need a, for every plant you need a stake. Commercially, that we've gone to a system uh, that, that uh, reduces the input as far as stakes, but also the time for tying. Uh, we've heard this called the uh, Missouri weave system or the Florida weave system. Uh, we don't care what you call it. It is a good system to utilize even in home gardens, but you basically have a stake, skip two plants, and another stake. And then with a piece of PVC pipe and a, a box of continuous string, you can go through and tie them. Um, you start tying early. Again, we want to keep them off the ground. Uh, so about nine inches, we want to make our first tie and then continue that over nine to 12 inches. And if you use this system, it is very important that your best stick in the field will be on the end. That's your anchor stake. And uh, if it goes, uh, we'll lose the, uh, the uh, tightness of our string down the whole row. This is just a shot that we do in a commercial field, but it is growing more and more common in home gardens. And uh, I can say uh, when I was young and we were tying tomatoes, one plant per stake, uh, it took a whole week to tie an acre of tomatoes. This system, one person can tie an acre in a day. And it's really simple. Like I say, you have a box of continuous string on your, on your hip, run through a pipe. You're coming down this side and you go around that stick and you go down and go around the next stick. You get down at the end, you just simply come up the other side and just wrap around the stick. It's just that simple. People can do it as fast as they walk, but it creates this nice trough where that tomato will not fall over. It can slide up and down, but it's not going to fall over to the soil. And that's okay. And like I said, you can go and buy this, uh, the box of strings on online, like uh, at many of our uh, 
uh, seed uh, catalogs will have tomato twine uh, that you can buy, and a box will last you several years. So might be worth the investment. Now we've talked about everything we can do to really prevent problems in tomatoes, but we will have them. Uh, spots, rots, and wilts is kind of what I uh, named this section because we're going to look at the major ones. This is not all of our problems, but a lot of times we start seeing spots on leaves and I get called, I, I got these brown spots on my leaf. What, what's wrong with it? What does it have? And uh, usually I, I can just tell them by the way they describe it. One of the major foliar disease is a fungus called early blight. And it'll start as small lesions and, and, and grow into these large ones. But if you look at those spots, you can see symmetrical rings on every one of them. It's almost like looking at where the, the, ring, the growth rings of a tree. And when you see that, it's early blight. And then, you know, that's a positive identification. Another fungus disease that we see is septorial. And it's really known as small brown, starts off as a small brown spot that will be uh, encompassed in a yellow halo. And then the centers will turn brown and sometimes even fall out altogether. So if that's what you're seeing, uh, then you know it's septoria, you need to add a fungicide. This one looks very similar to septoria, except one thing, you got the, the spot and you got the yellow halo. But if you look at those spots, they remain almost black or dark brown, where these kind of starts turning gray. And of course, you can have just brown spots. And usually that's gonna be a, identify another type of disease. This is bacteria canker. There's no rings, there's no halos. So there's some, some tips on try, trying to diagnose what you got, or at least describe what you're seeing when you call your county extension agent. <clears throat> Next one are rots. This is probably one of the most uh, frustrating parts of it because you have fruit on a vine and you see it go south quick. Uh, early blight will get on the uh, fruit just as well as the, uh, the leaves or the foliage. And, but if you look closely, now you might not can see it here, but there are rings just like it is on the foliar. And normally you'll only see it on the stem end for some reason. You don't see this on the bottom or the side. So if you see something like this at the stem end, it's a safe bet that you have early blight. You may not can do anything to save that particular cluster, but if you start your fungicides and pull these off, your next cluster may be early blight free. Uh, this one is late blight. This is one of the uh, ones we, we dread. Hopefully, or luckily, we don't see it very often. It's, it's usually associated with cool, sp wet springs. And uh, this is the disease, of course, everybody heard of the great potato famine in Ireland that drove uh, a lot of Irish into America, just migrating for a better life. This is the disease that, that done that. And up in the Irish potato region of the country, they really still dread this disease. And of course, they're a little further north, a little cooler, so it's really more predominant. We talked about staking to keep the fruit off the ground, and this is one of the disease or the rots that you can see from the fruits being in contact. It doesn't necessarily have to contact the ground, but a lot of times that's where you will see this. The early blot or blossom end rot, that's one that almost everybody sees from time to time. But keep in mind what causes blossom end rot is a calcium deficiency. And we'll go way back where we was talking about pH. We got to get that pH right. Uh, pH, uh, lime is one of our sources for calcium. And uh, if uh, the plants are growing and trying to expand very rapidly, if that plant experiences a shortage of calcium in doing so, that's where the blossom and rot will occur. Most of the time we do see it on the blossom, but you can have it on the side of the tomato, on top of the tomato. It's whatever part of that tomato is rapidly growing at the time is where you can have that. Now, you can also have calcium deficiencies in soils with a perfect pH, 6.5. And you go, man, my pH is just right. Why am I still having some blossom and rot? Well, keep in mind, we've talked about moisture of tomatoes. They like a consistent moist soil, not one that goes real dry to real soggy. 
Tomatoes are not able to pick up calcium if the soil is excessively dry. And wherever that plant is trying to grow when that occur, you'll have a blossom and rot problem. Same thing if you go to the other extreme, if it's really wet or you over irrigate, uh, the tomato can't pick up calcium in the soggy soils and you'll have blossom and rot. So one way to kind of to quickly uh, diagnose your problem uh, blossom and rot from a true calcium deficiency, say a low pH, almost every fruit will have blossom and rot on the vine. You'll just see it from top to bottom, from as little as your fingernail up to the big ones. If you just have a few on a cluster, the same size that came up with blossom and rot, that's kind of an indication that you've had a moisture problem. That somewhere in that development of that cluster, you let it either get too dry or too wet when that fruit was trying to expand. And those fruit had blossom and rot. The smaller ones below it, the bigger ones in front of it uh, are still fine. So it's just kind of an indication of where you're at in the product of, of your watering. If, if, if everything on the cluster is blossom and rot or if you just have certain size tomatoes. Next one, we're gonna talk about wilts. And mainly we go out today and our tomatoes look healthy and tomorrow we go out and they looks like this and that happens a lot <laughs> uh, there are several causes from it but I want you to look at how loaded up this particular vine has really produced we, we're about ready to start picking there's a little red one there uh, but we're still putting on smaller fruit and trying to grow them and we also want our plant to come up to the top of our stake so there's a lot of stress on that tomato plant requires a lot of moisture. And I say that in that our wilts are normally associated with a disease, a fungus, or bacteria that gets into the vascular bundles of our plants. And our vascular bundles is the plumbing of the plant. There's one vascular tissue that carries water up and there's another one that carries it down. Or you have something that just kind of rots the plant away. So if you have plants that just suddenly wilt within a day, first of all, look right where the plant comes up out of the ground. If you see cottony growth, like you do here, and some tiny little seed structures, uh, you have southern blight. And uh, there's not a lot you can do about southern blight, but you do need to remove that plant because those little small seed structure, if they slough off into the soil, are the part that will cause disease next time. It's kind of like seeding your soil. But the, the, the main identifying characteristic is the white growth on the lower part of the stem. You come over here at these other two, and they're both very common. Fusarium wilt is a fungus. Uh, it will actually uh, enter through the root. I mean, it's a soil born, but it's, it actually comes in through the root, goes up through the vascular tissue, and starts clogging it up. So when it's nice, warm, and hot, uh, that plant requires more water. Our roots can be down here trying to pump water up to the top, nutrients, and they just can't get enough uh, to supply what they need, and suddenly the plant wilt. Now, a lot of times fusarium wilt will take three or four days. It'll kind of wilt down and pick up, wilt down and pick up. Also, you'll probably see some canary yellow leaves associated with uh, fusarium wilt. That's just one of the identifying features that you can look at. If it's completely, uh, one half of the leaf is yellow or one side of the plant has turned yellow, that's a good sign that it's fusarium. Bacteria wilt, it's going to go down and you can't find a spot, you can't do anything. But if you do slice the stem, you'll see a darkening or down at the ground level of all vascular tissue, the form and the xylem, uh, and it's just what I, we talked about. The bacteria has formed and stopped the flow of nutrients from the roots up. In fact, there's a little quick test you can do with bacteria, and that's to uh, take a thin sliver right off the edge of the tomato vine and place it so just a little piece of it is in, wa in water, suspend it. And after about 20 minutes, you'll see just kind of a smoky streaming. I wish I had put a, a slide of that. And that's kind of a, a quick thing that you can do to, to confirm it and even show the homeowners. Um, if we ever revise this, well, then we might uh, include that. The other one, it's not a rot or spot or a wilt, but it's, it's a different thing we're seeing in viruses. Um, 
anything that really puckers, twists, uh, or leaves like this, we can just about consider a virus. And uh, luckily, we don't tend to have just a wide spread of viruses uh, that hits us all at once. We'll have these odd plant or two in our planting that has it. <clears throat> That's with the exception of tomato spotted wilt. Seem like when we have spotted wilt, we usually have a pretty heavy dose of it. And that's because it is spread by a little old insect called a thrip. And it's a carrier of the disease. And when it feeds on the plant, it feeds like a rasping, like sandpaper. And then they secrete a, an enzyme in there to soften the tissue. And when they make that secretion, they actually give the plant the disease. And because of the way that they uh, do that, there's no way to spray because if you have a, a pesticide out there and they light on a plant, by the time it has an opportunity to do its job, they've done transmitted the disease. But like I say, viruses, they're going to be puckering, twisting of the growth. And it'll, that'll tell you that it's probably a virus. And we have about eight of them out there. Uh, I'm going to talk about insects. And there's basically two categories of them. We have chewers and suckers. And uh, the chewers are stuff that actually eats the plant. It can happen really young. If you're a uh, cut worms, they'll just cut the plant off right there at the soil level. A lot of time you'll find it like this, but you normally always find the top part. Uh, if you've something been nibbled down and dragged off by a rabbit or something, you don't have a top part. So if it just simply falls over, you think that you, you've got a cut worm. You can dig in the soil just slightly and actually find it. You do see this more on newer gardens or expanded gardens. Older gardens don't have a lot of, of cut worms. The next one is going to be uh, our tomato fruit worm. And uh, he can be uh, quite the uh, destructive pest because uh, uh, their eggs are laid on the plant by a little old moth, look like a candle moth, kind of a gray, grayish brown. When they hatch, the eggs, uh, the eggs hatch, the little worms come out. And most of the time they do head down to our fruit. And the, the problem is once he entered the fruit, here, there's nothing you can do. And so if you see it, pull it off. Because if this fruit touches another fruit, you can bore right out of this one into the next one. And when he goes through that one, he can come out over here and run. One worm can, can run three or four fruit. The main thing on this is to be uh, aggressive on the front end as a preventative. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, they can cause a lot of damage real quick. They, they, the eggs are laid about the same time. They all hatch about the same time. So there's a lot of little worms out there at the same time. The same is true with this pest. Now, <clears throat> it just doesn't look like it's adult. This is the Colorado potato beetle, which is a large striped beetle. And they feed a little bit, but the main thing is they lay eggs and these little devils here emerges and they just will eat like crazy. Uh, they can do a lot of damage quick. And the key about here is as they get bigger, they're harder to control. So, you know, be, be out in your garden looking and, and scouting. Make sure that uh, nothing get out of hand. Anything, the smaller anything is, the better you can control it. This one, this is kind of an oddball one. It's uh, you're kind of exciting when you see it. You'll walk out and there won't be a leaf left on the plant. You can look down on the ground and you can see their, their dropping. And you stare and stare and stare, and you can't really see him. He really blends in. As big as he is, he's really hard to see. And when you see him, you're just like a snake. You go, oh, there he is. And uh, so it's, it's, it's just kind of interesting the way they feed and, and uh, can hide from you. The next ones are suckers. And these are plant bugs or insects that actually suck sap from the plant. They don't eat the plant. And this causes uh, a, a problem because a lot of our pesticides are coatings or uh, surface tension. They are on the surface, the chewers eat the leaf. Uh, in turn, they ingest the pesticide, which control them. The suckers don't ingest much of the outside, so they're harder to control. They got a little pierce, if you think of a mosquito, when it bites you. They send a style in and they're drinking the plant juices through a straw. So they don't consume much of the surface. These you have to kill by contact insecticides. This one is a stink bug. He can, he can, he can cause a lot of problem with foliage 
But you'll usually see the damage from stink bug is when they start to ripen. They have little yellow spots all over them. Uh, it doesn't really hurt the tomato. As you see, just peel it out and, and you do it. But <clears throat> if you're growing for uh, home gardeners or, or farmer's market, they can show up. Uh, these over here are aphids. Uh, they, they're always on the undersurface of the leaves. Uh, you can go out and just inspect and say, oh, I don't have just a few. Three days later, it can look like this if they go unchecked. Uh, they're different colors. There's the rosy ones, they're red. You've got green ones and black ones. But uh, they're pretty easy to spot if you look underneath the leaves, which is unlike this one. Uh, this is a spider mite. So you're looking at the vein of a leaf right here. And on top of that vein is one spider mite but you have literally thousands of them on there. And uh, most of the time you'll see this when it starts getting really hot. You'll look at the top of the plant and it just looks a little bronze. Or actually, if you're out early enough, you can see dew on the spider webs. There is a spider mite. And uh, once you have it, it takes a special uh, insecticide to take care of that. So be sure to you know, contact your county extension office if you see that bronzing. One way, when you see something like that in the top, and as I've gotten older and went from no glasses to single lens and then bifocals and trifocals, it's hard for me to see spider mites. So what I'll do, I'll carry a white card in my shirt pocket and I can put my, my card down and lean that plant over and tap on it. And when you do, you'll see the, the, the insects. You'll see the aphids just boldly but you'll see these red little dots starting to move, and that's when you know you got spider mites. And like I said, you need to go and get an, an insecticide that will take care of them. And there's several out there that will, you just have to look for them. We talk about all our pests, diseases, and insects, and depending on where you stand on, on using them, uh, we're gonna talk about the ideal situation. Commercially, everything is preventable. You, if you're at the grocery store and you have a tomato over here that's beautiful, looks like a little tennis ball and bright red, and then you look at this one, it has a little scratch or something where something feed on it, which one are you gonna buy? And of course, people are gonna buy the prettiest, and I don't, I don't blame them, I do the same thing if I'm paying for it. If you're strictly a home gardener, a lot of times you can take a lot of damage before it really affects whether or not you're gonna utilize that fruit. Uh, but if you something you, you're really wanting is to have good looking fruit, maybe you participate in the local farmer's market, this is a very good general purpose spray. Uh, by using this, what we're gonna say once a week, but if you'll keep it on, because uh, these are coverage sprays, they just stay on top of the surface, and if it rains, it washes off. So you have to reapply these every time it rains. If it's not raining, they may last seven to 10 days. But an insecticide called seven is really good for your chewing insects. Malathion, as many different company names, uh, is really good for the suckers. Keep in mind that if you do have aphids and white flies and lace wings and, and spider mites, in order to really control them, they're hiding under the leaf surface. So a coverage spray on top will not take care of them. So you're gonna to have to get down and, and, and pour some spray up from the bottom up in order to get to them. Uh, we talked about the fungus diseases, the early blight and stuff like that, and a good broad spectrum fungicide, Daconil, widely available, is an excellent one. It has a wide array uh, for foliar uh, fungus diseases. And uh, you can about find it in every garden center. The one uh, for bacteria, we looked at bacteria spec, there's three more, there's bacteria canker and bacteria spot. In our part of the world are uh, really starting to be uh, uh, a handful, simply because we haven't advanced technology-wise as far as uh, the preventative sprays. My father used fixed coppers in the 1960 on his commercial tomato farm, and they, we still do. Um, but you, what you want to do is be prepared for it and purchase your fixed copper early. Have some on hand because most stores aren't used to stocking it. When they do, they maybe have one case of 12 or one case of 24. And when they're gone, they don't reorder. 
and there you're caught if you start having bacteria problems and you can't find your fixed copper. So buy some of these ahead of time. It will last several years. Just follow the directions, store them properly, don't let them freeze, keep them in a dark, cool area, and before using, shake them up really well. Some of these will, will start to uh, separate. Just shake it up before using. And uh, you do this about every seven to 10 days and you will have good tomatoes or pretty tomatoes. Some problems that pops up is I'm having vines and blooms, but I'm not setting fruit. And one is the temperature. Remember, uh, tomatoes are like you. They like the same temperature you like. And when you get outside that comfort zone, you will start having some uh, fruit setting problems. Uh, usually the nights uh, in the 70s and days in the 90s, you'll see less fruit being set just because of that. Sometimes you can over fertilize with the nitrogen cause will cause uh, reduced fruit setting, lack of sunlight. There's several things. So, you know, just look around and see which one uh, might, hit, might be a hamper in your garden. Uh, it usually more or less will be temperature and be driven by weather. And you can get by some of that, especially if you like tomatoes in the heat of the summer, use a heat set tomato like uh, solar set or, or heat wave. We're gonna talk just briefly about manures or preventative, but know your stuff. Keep in mind that you go down to your neighbor or somewhere and, and pick up some cow manure or horse manure. There are herbicides that's applied on the pasture that can be carried over into the grass, even run through the animal and deposit it and still have trace amounts located in it. And if you put it in your garden, the plants will pick up on it and uh, cause problems. So you'll see a lot of twisting, turning. Uh, so again, sometimes if you don't know the history of your manure, it's, it's okay to say, no, I don't, I don't need it. I don't know it for sure. I don't want to use it. Herbicides, contamination is quite common. This top one is, is gysophate. Sometimes you may be edging your garden and you don't wrench your sprayer out good. <clears throat> then you come along and you apply one of them general purpose sprays and get a low dose on them. It may not kill the plants, but it can stun them and maybe cause some fruit setting problems. Uh, you or maybe a neighbor has sprayed his lawn weeds with one of the two four Ds, the, the weed be gone or something like that, and you get a little drift over. And uh, you start seeing that curling pucking, pucker and we talked about with viruses, which you look at something and you got to figure, what is this? Is this herbicide or is it a virus? And one thing to look at, if it's a virus, most of the time you'll just have one or two. But if it affects half your stand, it's probably a herbicide problem that has drifted in. Most viruses will not be 100% in your stand. And with that, that ends my presentation. I hope uh, you have something, you have gained something from it. And uh, if you have any questions, contact your county extension agent. And uh, remember that they have the ability, if they don't know, to send that sample to our plant pathologist uh, at Fayetteville, Dr. Sherry Smith, and uh, she can confirm uh, the main problem. Right, but thank you so much for sharing You're with us. I know I learned a lot. And thank you for joining us, and we hope that you have a great day and have a great tomato crop. Thank you. Mm -hmm.